Well, good morning. It is so great to see you. Would you stand with us? If you are watching online this morning, it is great to have you with us today. Hey, if you want, you can worship up here at the front. It's going to be a while. shake their hand, and we're going to watch an announcement video, okay? Welcome to Journey Church. I'm Kenzie. And I'm Rachel. And we serve here on the worship team. We are so excited that you're joining us this morning. And you should know that we've been praying for you to experience God in a new way today. Whether you're joining us online or if you're here in the room, 
Our vision at Journey is to be a church where people find transformation through Jesus. We have a heart for this community and want to be a part of offering hope, healing, and a feeling of home to all who are part of this valley. If this is your first time with us, we can't wait to meet you. Our desire is that you feel welcome from the first moment you walk in the door. If you have children with you, we'd love for you to take advantage of our amazing children's ministry here at Journey. If you haven't gotten the chance to check in your child into our children's services happening right now next door, you can find one of our host teams in the back and they'll take you right where you need to go. If you are new to Journey or would like to get to know more about our church, get plugged into community, or serving in some really exciting ways, Discovery is your next step. Yeah, our Discovery courses are offered once a month and we wanna make it easy and fun for you to get connected in the Journey family. One of the ways we worship together and honor God is through our giving. There are several ways that you can give. Online, through our church app, by clicking on the link in the comments, or for physical offerings, you can use the giving stations in the back of the room or send it in the mail. Your giving impacts not only this community, but our world, as we support over 50 different missionaries and projects all over the globe in the hope of reaching people everywhere with the message of Jesus. At Journey, we believe that we can never outgive God. And our prayer is that our giving continues to grow His kingdom here in our valley and across our world. To stay connected, download our church app, follow us on social media, or visit us online. If you'd like to share today's message or rewatch any past messages, make sure and subscribe to, to our, our YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. <laughs> we can't wait to hear all that God does in your life this morning at Journey. <laughs> Good morning, Journey Church. Love to welcome you guys here and online. We have an amazing online campus. Can we welcome our online campus this morning? They're amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. If I haven't had a chance to meet you guys, my name is Pastor Tell. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And man, Journey Church is the greatest way to start my week. Um, just the praise and the, word, the presence of God here and just being with the community of believers. This is the greatest community. I just love being a part of it. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Um, I want to let you guys know about some great things that are coming up. If you want to know more, there's a QR code in front of you or there's a link in the comment section if you're online. If you want to scan that QR code or click that link. That'll give you all the information about upcoming events or anything you need to know about Journey Church. I'm just going to highlight a couple of the big ones coming up. Um, here at Journey Church, we believe that the best way to be a part of the body of Christ is to be connected. And the best way to be connected is to find out what really helps you come alive. We don't we don't believe that serving at a church is something that um, you need need to do. It's something we get to do. So we want to help you do that. So we have something called Inside Track that helps you get connected to the body. We, we're offering that October 16th. So if you'd like more information about that, that's coming up. Uh, you can sign up at the Welcome Center or online at thejourneylife.org backslash events or see Pastor Jerry for more information about that. It's a great opportunity to just find out more about yourself and get connected to the church. We'd love for you to be a part of that. We also have something coming up which is close to my heart because I'm the youth pastor here, a youth convention. Youth convention is awesome. I love youth convention. It's a it's a October 21st and 22nd. It's a two-day event. It's basically a concert with Jesus. And it's an amazing time to just really get your students amped up for Jesus. But what I love about it is we've had students get healed at these events. We've had students come that have been addicted to drugs, have been addicted to alcohol, addicted to pornography, come to these events, and God has set them free at these events. And so that's why we, we don't believe that these events are just something to go and rah, rah. We believe that the power of God is there when there's a group of young people praising God, completely abandoned to him. There's a purpose behind this. So I encourage you, if you have young people between the ages of 12 and 18 in middle school or high school, please uh, get on the journeylife.org backslash events. There's still time to sign them up. If you have any questions, come see me. I'll be out in the lobby and around. I'd love to talk to you about that. And lastly, uh, we have, the last thing we have coming up is worship night. You guys love worship night? I love worship nights. Worship nights are great. We have one coming up October 5th, this Wednesday night. October 5th. So you want to be there. We come together. The whole family comes together, and we just worship Jesus. And then we have an after party. 
because ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. So we believe that there's going to be, there's parties in the Bible, there's going to be a party in heaven. So we get together, we experience the presence and the power of God together. We see, we have seen God move in some powerful ways. We have seen relationships restored in these nights. We've seen families come together. We've seen prodigals come home out of these nights. Prayers birthed out of these nights have led to families coming home. It's amazing. It's powerful because it's the family coming together to pray for the family. Amen. So, so you do not want to miss Wednesday night. And then we party afterwards because we celebrate what God is doing, what God has done, and what God is going to do. So it's an exciting time. So be here this Friday night. Um, but speaking of worship, are you guys ready to get back to it? So let's stand. Can you guys stand with me this morning? One of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and um, I've been looking through kind of the Old Testament and comparing it to the New Testament and one of the things I love about God is he's the same but different. Now, what I mean about that is if you look at God, his character is consistent. He's always loving, always forgiving, always righteous, always full of justice. But he doesn't always talk to everybody the same. He's creative. He's unique. He talks to each of us in a way we can understand. He, he meets us where we are. He's the same God. And what I love about this, this song we're going to sing is... It says, I, the same God that, and it, it, it talks about David and Mary, but he met each of those people in a different way. God wants to meet you in a different way, but he's the same God that took down giants. He's the same God that performed miracles. He's the same God that raised the dead. He is the same God with the same power. He hasn't diminished. He hasn't diminished, but he wants to meet you where you are. So Jesus, today we believe that you are the same God that spoke worlds into existence. You are the same God that walked out of that tomb and then rolled away the stone. We believe that you are the same God that baptized your believers with Holy Spirit and with fire. And we believe you're gonna do that this morning. So Jesus, you are the same God. We declare that, we believe that, and we just submit to whatever you wanna do today, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, amen.
would you just lift your voices? Would you lift your hands with me all across this place? The King of Kings is in this room. Come on, let's sing it again. All hail King Jesus. Oh, hail King He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. your hands lifted would you just begin to offer praise to your God come on with your own words with your own song with your own heart Lord we worship you we magnify your holy name Jesus you are the king of kings oh king of glory enter in have your way in this place God Lord in every heart in every room watching God we just say have your way Lord you are the king of glory enter in all hail King Jesus Lord, there is no God like you. You stand alone as God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who was and is and is to come. We bless you, Jesus. We magnify your holy name, O God. We glorify your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I praise you. I thank you for every heart and life that is here today, every life watching and joining online. We thank you that you are a faithful God. We thank you that you are the same God of Scripture as you are today in 2022, that you don't change, God. There is nothing impossible with you today. Father, I pray for every individual, every heart, every life, that you would come and be our deliverer, that you would be our Savior, that you would be our Lord that you would come and meet us right where we are because you know us personally. God, I thank you that you are not just a corporate God, but you are personal. <laughs> that you know us by name. You know the details of our life. And Lord, I just pray those who feel distant from you, those who feel removed from you for whatever situation, that you would just come and minister your presence and your peace in the midst of what they're going through, God. We give you all the glory. We give you the, all the honor, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, would you have your way in this place? Would you have your way in this place? Thank you, Jesus. Just say this simple prayer with me. With uh, Agree with me today. Say, Jesus, thank you for laying down your life. And thank you for giving me life today. If you believe that, would you just say amen this morning? Amen. Amen. We serve a good God. Amen. Hey, before you're seated, uh, and I want to kind of just stay in this moment, just look at somebody next to you and say, Jesus is king. Come on, just say, Jesus is king. And would you be seated for just a moment? And in a moment, we're going we're gonna to sing that song one more time with a little bit different flair to it. But if you got, when you came in the room today, you received communion, and uh, you got the cup and the wafer. And um, we're going to partake of communion today, which I believe and I'm grateful for. It's a reminder of what Jesus has done for us. And uh, I don't know if you're here today for the first time, maybe watching for the first time. I want you to know before we partake of communion, even read scripture, that there's a God that loves you. His name is Jesus. And the reason we're in here singing is not because we're weird. It's because he's worthy. And it's not because we always necessarily like to. It's because he gave us breath. We're going to give it back to him. But some of you today, maybe you've never experienced the love of Christ. I want to read to you a scripture. And by the way, if you've not gotten the communion elements, uh, you just maybe raise your hand. We have ushers that'll uh, get you those. And uh, they can kind of make room. If you're at home and you're like, man, I didn't know. This is one of those things online. We don't know how to fully prepare. Man, grab something. I'm going to talk for a minute. And then I'd love to have you join us in partaking of communion today. So run to the fridge, run somewhere, get a cracker and uh, something to drink if you can and just be symbolic of this moment. In the Bible, it says in Luke chapter 22, it's the scripture where Jesus is sitting down with his disciples and I, I love this scripture and it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 14, it said, when the time had come that Jesus and the apostles sat down together at a table, Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you. First thing to note before we get into this, that Jesus is a personal God. He wants to be near you. I love how he does a lot of ministry at tables. We in the New Testament, or we in the modern culture, we make it all about church, but God
God loved doing things at tables because he liked being personal where you were. And he gathered with his disciples around a table and he said, I'm eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until the meaning of it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves for I will not drink this again until the kingdom of God has come. I love what the book of Matthew says. The book of Matthew gives us this same account and it says this, that Jesus took the blood and he said, I am giving you this as a symbol of my forgiveness of your sins and a reminder of your covenant. How many of you could say today just with a raised hand that Jesus has set you free and he's forgiven you of your sins and you're grateful for that today, man? Isn't it amazing that he gave you forgiveness when you didn't deserve it? Before you were even a thought on mom and dad's brain, he gave you forgiveness. And he will do that for every generation from here on forward. I love the fact that Jesus gave his life for you. And it says he forgave your sins as a covenant. Then it says this in verse 19. He said, then he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it into pieces. And he gave to the disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do in remembrance of me. I felt like as I was thinking about this morning, this fact of how our God is a generous God. And can I just be honest with you? I struggle with being generous. I have a 17-year-old daughter that would give everything she had away. I have a mother-in-law give everything she had away. But I struggle being generous sometimes. Yet Jesus was so generous that he gave his life to give us life. And he allowed his body, the Bible says in Isaiah, to be disfigured and unrecognizable. We read it here in Luke. For us to be healed and for us to have healing, not just of body, but of soul and of spirit. I'm so grateful that the entire Passover and the symbol of communion today is not about us getting, it's about him giving. See, sometimes it changes the way that I look at this communion table because I, I come to God humble and grateful and I understand all that and I'm so thankful for what he's done. But don't lose sight that we only have the gratitude to give back because of what he's already done for us. And the communion table we celebrate today is all about Jesus giving. He's giving you freedom. He's giving you deliverance. You're in this room right now. He's here to heal you. He's here to set you free. Some of you came in with bondage and addiction and we're singing about God and his greatness and his, his faithfulness. You're like, I don't understand. I believe today there's freedom in your life that God's gonna give as you partake today. And I wanna do this this morning as you just open these, uh, these elements and grab the bread. I wanna pray this over the bread this morning. Jesus broke the bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he began to distribute it to his disciples. As we've distributed this in likeness of what the New Testament teaches, I believe God not only wants us to distribute bread, he wants to distribute healing in this room. He wants to distribute peace. How many of you know we live in a culture of chaos? Double-mindedness. There's peace for you and his name is Jesus. It's not something, he's someone. If you need healing distributed, if you need peace today, you need soundness of mind, maybe you came in depressed, discouraged, maybe you're watching at home and you're just anxious, I believe the Bible is very clear that God wants to set your anxiety free because Jesus is the one that wants to heal you. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything give thanks to God. Would you grab this bread? And if you would just say, I'm a candidate of needing a distribution of the healing of God, would you just simply agree with this prayer today with me? Father, I thank you for your body that was broken. And Lord, though we sit here and we receive healing, we're so grateful that you first gave it. I can't receive what you've not given. And Lord, in this room, there are people that need healing of mind, of soul, of body. There are people in this room that just need a miracle physically. We just declare, God, that the same God who healed throughout Scripture is the same God in this room to heal in this place. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring healing. Lord, I pray soundness over every mind right now in this room. I pray the peace of God would reign in a society that's chaotic, in a society that's fearful. We just say, God, that you are releasing peace to individuals across this room, not corporate, but individuals across this room. And we receive what you've distributed over 2,000 years ago, your healing. Father, we thank you for your body that was broken. We thank you that you were unrecognizable by men, but it allows us to be recognized by a holy God. And Jesus, we're humbled by this moment. We thank you for your body that was broken in Jesus' name, amen. Would you just partake of this today? Confess, maybe with even a raised hand that you, let, 
let's just ask it this way. How many of you sometimes struggle forgiving others? Just, how many of you find great ease forgiving others? Okay, there's, now we're getting a little more. The rest that didn't raise their hand are on the first one there. That's the problem with most of us. Isn't it crazy to consider that we got forgiveness that we did not deserve? Because we're born into sin. We're born into a place where we are all sinners. The Bible says, Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus forgives us of sin. And I want to just give this opportunity right now. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor, I'm a candidate of God's forgiveness that came through his son, Jesus. You're here today and you maybe for the first time would like to say, I, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to give him my life. Or maybe you're here today and you would say, in a moment, I'm going to have you raise your hand and we're going to celebrate with you before we partake today. But this was what the communion represented. We remember what Jesus has done. Maybe you're far from God or maybe you're not walking where you need to be and you would say, I, I want to just receive forgiveness today. Does it mean you're not going to heaven? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved. If you've believed, but maybe you've walked away because you've walked into sin, it's important to get back right with God. But if you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, or you want to say, I, I want to make my life right, or you're online, I want to give my life to Jesus, would you just boldly right where you are before we partake? We're going to celebrate with you, and they're going to remember this moment. Would you just raise your hand right where you are? I just want to surrender my life to Jesus. Is there anybody today? Boldly, come on. Just be bold. I want to surrender my life to Christ. That's awesome. Praise God right here in the front. Hang on, wait. Anybody else want to join this gal today? Praise God. Anybody else want to just surrender? I want to make my life right with God. Anybody I'm missing? Amen. Awesome, right on the front row. Gosh, smack me in the face, man. It's good to see you. I love you. Anybody else want to join these two? Come on. Best decision you'll ever make. Amen. Awesome. That's awesome. Praise God. Hey, listen. Listen here. Oh, we can partake and then go home. We're having church right now. I love this. I'd like us in a moment. We're going to celebrate with these three. But can I just pray? Because I, I kind of thought about this. It's hard to clap when you have juice in your hand. We're going to celebrate you guys in just a minute. Would you grab this and just say this with me? Say, thank you, Jesus, for the cross where I'm forgiven and I'm redeemed in Jesus' name. Come on, would you partake of the juice this morning? Amen. Amen, I think it'd be fitting to kind of conclude this moment. In a moment, we're gonna sing a song. Can you three that, that raise your hand, can I ask you boldly, would you stand? Would you guys just stand? Would you, these three that, man, would you stand? Come on, let's give these guys a big hand, amen. stand right here. Can, uh, Nick, you want to stand? Can you guys stand? Leah, can you get, and Dad, Derek, why don't you grab your daughter and get with her? Hey, can we pray for these right now? And uh, let's just pray and celebrate with them. I'd like you to stand with me all across this place as we pray for these right now. Come on, let's just pray. Would you even, if you're near them, just begin to pray. This is the greatest decision. The Bible says, all of heaven rejoices when one comes to salvation. Lord, we pray for these this morning. We thank you for this decision of them just acknowledging in a room full of people saying, I need you, Jesus, that without you, my life is nothing. God, would you just bring an element of forgiveness in this moment? Would you bring an element of your personal relationship to us right now? God, would you just surround these three that have said, we want to give our life to Christ. God, we rejoice with them. We celebrate with them. And we say, thank you, God, that one has come home, that one has come into relationship with Jesus. We are grateful for forgiveness today, and we're grateful for your son Jesus that laid down his life. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing. Oh, help me, Jesus. Oh,
prayer service at 8 o'clock. And this, this scripture is so indicative of what the Bible says. Remember when Jesus came back into Jerusalem? It says that he came into Jerusalem and they began to celebrate and worship him with palm branches. But before that it said, many came to see him. I felt like the Lord spoke to me today that, that many of you are here to see Jesus, not to see a man, not to see a song, not to see a sermon. And there's celebration that comes with it. And it says this, it says, and they shouted as Jesus came in. I know I'm stretching some of you. Some of you from conservative backgrounds are like, dear God, what did I come into? I'd like to ask you to do something because there's so much scripture about shout unto God with a voice of triumph, shouting and lifting up the name of Jesus. I'd like us to take just a moment and if you need a victory in your life, um, how many of you have ever heard in the sports world this thing called momentum? Momentum is a crazy thing. And you know what's crazy? Sometimes momentum happens before they've gotten the victory. It's just they've gotten a little bit of an edge. They've cut the deficit closer. Some of you may be going through it. And, and in that momentum, a lot of times it happens with fans. And by the way, I don't believe in being a fan of Jesus. We're called to be followers of Christ. But as followers of Christ, can we just shout the name of Jesus? Come on, on the count of three. Let's just lift his name up in this place. You may think it's crazy. Join us at home. One. with it one more time. Oh. five, four or five people around you. Just give them a high five. Tell them how good they look today, man. Amen. It is good to see you today. Great to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, I just want to say publicly before I get into the message um, this morning, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Isaiah. 58. If you don't have your Bible, put your camera on your phone over the QR code in front of you. It'll bring up a digital Bible. But we're going to jump into Isaiah 58. Don't tune me out yet when you start looking at what we're talking about today. Because I, I promise you today is potentially one of the most unexciting and unpopular sermons you will ever hear in the world. I'm just giving you that right from the get-go. So we had a great time with communion, celebrating with these who've made a decision to serve Jesus. And now we're going to talk about a subject in a moment called fasting. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't like fasting, but God told me to do it. So before you tune me out, I just want to say publicly, first of all, thank you for allowing me a little time. And I, I just have a great staff, great board. And uh, to answer the question publicly, I did not harvest a bull this year. Uh, it wasn't that your prayers weren't on point. My target was not on point. So that's just the reality of it. And uh, I had a great time. See, I'm blaming the elk for the problem. The target, not the shooter. Um, I, I had a great time. Got to see a bunch of elk. Got in on a couple big ones last day, especially. Um, I did... Uh, I don't know. I, I'm probably going to regret telling you. I did shoot one opening day, but I just shoulder punched it and the arrow bounced out. He's fine. He's not in the middle of the woods wounded. There was nothing. So I'm just telling you, but that's just life. It's a life of hunting and had a great time. Thank you for letting me go. And uh, those of you who prayed, thank you for letting me uh, be a part of your prayers for a season. Sorry, your freezer doesn't have any meat in it from that. But I had a, a wonderful time, and I'm just grateful to be a part of uh, just out in creation and enjoy what God has given us to be blessed with for a couple weeks. And, um, and, and, and reminded again, we have an incredible team at this church. 
that I'm gone and I honestly didn't even sweat it. Uh, like there were a couple funerals that happened and things. It's like crazy. And I know some of you are like, well, pastor, you should. I'm grateful for our staff. I'm grateful for our team. I'm grateful for our volunteers. Thank you for just being a great church and uh, being a part of God's ministry to the body. And um, I'm so grateful we're not a church built on a personality, but we're built on Jesus. And, and I just want to say thank you for that publicly. Um, uh, how many of you know someone in your life, are sitting next to someone in your life, or are that person in your life who suffers from a disorder called being hangry? Anybody have the hangry disorder? Okay, I have two of them in my family that have that disorder, and they cause me great, great pangs a lot of times. Hangry is when you have hunger pains that make you grumpy at everybody around you until you feel and fill those hunger pains. So that's what the disorder, and I just made up. It's not really a disorder. It's just a disorder in my house. It's called being hangry. I can tell when my wife, I mean, when, when uh, the, someone in my family, when she starts to get hangry, it's like you get out of the way, and all you do is find out what's going to make her happy. Anybody know that? that kind of a person. So I, I know I'm talking about a subject today called fasting, and we're in this series called Build This House, um, talking about the house of God and also our personal house. Um, uh, the Bible says in Peter, remind you again, we are a church that is made up of living stones. Every one of you is a living part of the body of Christ that makes up the greater body. And a principle we've often forgotten in the church that we don't build upon is a subject of fasting. Last week, great message on community prayer and, and group prayer and all that and learning about prayer. Some of you say, again, why, Pastor, why are we talking about some of these? They're foundational. You know what I've learned is most of us are building our houses on sand, not on foundations. I don't want to be a house that's built on just feeling and emotion. I want to be built on the Word of God. And fasting is a, a principle and a, 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 a subject we should talk a lot more about, building this house. Before we do in Isaiah 58, I want to tell you a couple things that fasting is not. Number one, fasting is not a spiritual dieting program. Okay, just so you know, fasting is not a spiritual dieting program. For many of us, it's like, I'm going to fast because I could use it. All of us could use a little weight loss in some place. Not all of us, but some of us could use weight loss. But it is not a dieting program. Why is that important? Because if you're not careful, you will look at fasting from really just a physical place and a personal place instead of the spiritual context of it. Does it help you health-wise? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it something that will benefit your health? Absolutely. But it's not something you do simply to be a dieting program. It brings your body and your soul into alignment with God's spirit and what he's called you to. But don't look at it as a dieting program. Fasting is also not a means to just get what I want from God. Okay, I want you to hear that again. For many of us, we have reduced fasting to thinking that I can just turn. Uh, remember the old gumball machines you used to put a nickel or a quarter, or however old you are, whatever inflation did to your life. I remember the quarter machines. You put a quarter in, you turn it, and you hope to get that piece of gumball coming out. And there's all the colors, and then there's the baseball ones. Anybody remember those machines? That is not what fasting does to your God. Fasting is not putting another dime in the jukebox, a quarter in a gumball machine, and you twist it and God gives you what you want. That's not what fasting is. Does God answer prayers? Does God work on behalf of our fasting? And yes, he does. But some of us approach it simply from a place. If I do it, he'll give it. That's not what God says. What would happen if we just fasted with absolutely no expectation of God answering? We just did it because he called us to obey him. See, I think so many times when we fast, or if we fast, we simply do it because we have expectation of return. What if we just did it because God said do it? It's healthy. It's needful. It aligns my spirit to his will. Aligns my flesh to his purposes. So be careful that you don't reduce fasting to simply a means to getting what you want from God. And, and then I, I think this is important as well. Fasting is not a process of elimination to get God to change his mind. I have heard people in the church say, well, if I fast, God will change his mind. Your fasting is not going to change God's mind. It might change your mind and your will to align with his purpose, but it doesn't change his mind. So be careful that you don't approach fasting from that mindset. I will also tell you this, as I have uh, learned in a, in a discussion a couple months ago from uh, Pastor Janice Truern uh, in talking. By the way, fasting in our culture has become popular to where we call Daniel fast something that aren't Daniel fast. I'm just going to be blunt. And I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender right now. How many are you okay with that? All right. When the Bible talks about fasting, it never talked about your social media for a season. The Bible strictly, when it talks about fasting, is aligning itself to food. 
And can I just be blunt? We are a rotund community who could potentially use a little help sacrificing some things, but we are in love with food in America. And fasting calls me to consecrate my heart and sacrifice some pleasure in that. Pastor, I don't understand. We've fasted things before. I understand that there are seasons you take a break and you, you fast, but when it speaks scripturally, fasting directly relates to the use of food. It's not your social media and your Facebook, and you may feel like you need a break from that, but what would happen if you actually said, you know what, God, I'm going to really just get down to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fast something in, in, in line of food. Daniel fast, we know that there were certain types of food they fasted, but it was still regarding food. So look at your neighbor and say, food is okay. Don't get mad. Come on. Just tell them. All right, here we go. So what is fasting? Before we get into Isaiah 58, fasting is, fasting is a spiritual discipline. How many of you could use a little discipline? Don't raise your hand. It is a spiritual discipline that positions my heart and my spirit to heed the will of God and obey him. Isn't it amazing? We have no problem talking about reading our Bible as a spiritual discipline and prayer as a spiritual discipline. And, and I think at Journey Church, there's a lot of us that believe the church of God and being a part of corporate worship is a spiritual discipline. We have all these things that we don't hesitate to say that's a spiritual discipline, but fasting don't go there. Fasting is a spiritual discipline that aligns my heart and my spirit to heed and obey the heart and the spirit of God. Secondly, fasting is a physical posture and position that will demand spiritual action. I want to say this. And we're going to look in Isaiah 58. If you fast and there's no action, it's a diet program. Fasting without action is dieting. Fasting will be a call to action in some way. We're going to read it in a moment in Isaiah 58 where we see God literally give this sermon on fasting through Isaiah about we are called to action. If our fasting doesn't call you to some sort of action, it's just you skipping a few meals. Church, God wants us to fast so we can hear his heart and obey his will. Jesus actually said it this way. He said, there are some demons, scary word, demons that will not come out unless there is fasting and prayer. Translation, if I don't fast, there's no freedom. If I don't pray, there's no freedom. Some of us are praying for results, but we haven't sacrificed at a deeper level to get those results. And by the way, can I just say this? I'm going to lay it out here blunt. The spiritual discipline, Pastor Jan, I'm sorry, I do not like fasting. I struggle with fasting. I like food. I emotionally eat at times. It is an issue in my life. I'm just confessing. It's good for the soul, not the reputation. Fasting is not a discipline. I used to watch my dad fast. I'm like, dude, it's like he has no problem fasting. I have a, an uncle that fasted on two occasions, like 40-day fast. And I'm like, you're out of control. One time he came out of a 40-day fast and ate Mexican food. Don't do that, please. That is unwise. <laughs> Some of you, fasting's awesome, but you know what fasting will do is it aligns my soul and my heart and my spirit to the will of God. It is something that will call me to spiritual action. Can I just say we live in a culture that needs the church to be, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. And the third thing fasting is, fasting is a call to both spiritual and practical action to those around us. Not only is it spiritual action in my life, but it should call us to practical action to those around us. So a spiritual house is built upon spiritual principles. And I want to talk about the subject of fasting. Isaiah 58, if you're there, say, I got it. Here we go. Verse one, shout with a voice of triumph and a trumpet's blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Now I want to kind of give you context. Verse one is the introduction of a sermon. The next few verses are a rabbit trail in a sermon. And then the last part of this is where the pastor or the prophet Isaiah lands on the context of his sermon. So he gives this great introduction. Shout with a voice and a trumpet's blast. Shout aloud. That's the word given to the people of Israel. Don't be timid. How many of you know we could use a little more of this in the church today? And then it says, go tell my people about their sins. And then verse two kind of has this rabbit trail. Yet they act so proud. In other words, we're called to tell people of their sins, talk to people about who the goodness of God is. But then listen to what the Bible says. The people of Israel are so pious. They come to the temple every day and they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation. That would never abandon the laws of God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. I want you to listen to this. Have any of you ever lived in this place where you're, you can be pious? You're in the house of God. You're delighted to learn about God, but what good is learning without action? 
They ask me to take action on their behalf. God, would you do this? Would you break through? Would you move in this? And, and I act like I want to be near you, but I just want you to do something on my behalf. I really don't care to be close to you. And then it says this in verse three, we have fasted before you. This is what this generation says. We have fasted before you. We say, why, uh, and they say, why aren't you impressed, God? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. In other words, it is a works-driven culture. They were fasting. God, please be impressed with my fasting. I'm working hard to look good, but I have this whitewashed tomb. I'm not really looking good and acting like I should be. And then it says this, I will tell you why the Lord responds. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. I love that. I love how God just tells it how it is. You fast, what good is it? You're still fighting. You're bickering. You're bitter. You're sowing discord. What good is it to act holy. Fast forward, Jesus said to the Pharisees, hey, when you fast, don't get up and act like it. Don't tell everybody. Don't talk about it. Don't go, oh, I'm fasting and your face looks like it. Go in the secret fast and get the mind of Christ and act on what he tells you. And yet we have a church, if we're not careful, not journey, but the church culture can be a people like this that looks impressive or wants to impress or acts certain ways, but we have no action. Verse five, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress up in burlap. You cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think that I pleased with that? This is powerful. I'm going to let Jesus preach. God preach this, not me. Verse six, no, no, that is not the kind of fasting that I want. It's a correction to a nation. This is the kind of fasting that I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. How many of you have a relative you want to hide from? Don't raise your hand. Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds. Isn't it amazing that the answer they need came out of the action they did. See, sometimes we approach God, I'm fasting, give me the answer. God says, no, I want you to fast and take action, and then I'm going to answer. Look at the principle. Go and bring freedom to those that are oppressed. Bring healing to those that are bound. Share food with those that are hungry. Give shelter to those that are homeless. Put clothing on those that are naked. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. It is completely different than the other culture that we were being addressed with. The other culture said, here am I. It's all about me. And God said, no, that's not the kind of fast I've called you to. Verse nine, then when you call on me, I'll answer. I'm here and quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading rumors of others. Feed the hungry. Help those in trouble. Your light will come and shine out of the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry, restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you you will even rebuild. What are we talking about? Building a house. You're going to rebuild deserted ruins in your cities, and then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. I want to talk about this subject of fasting from the book of Isaiah, and if you're taking notes, there are a couple simple things that I'd like you to write down. First thing you need to make note of that God is addressing in the book of Isaiah through the subject of fasting is this. Fasting is less about acting like a Christian and more about the action of a believer. Fasting is less about acting like a Christian and more about action of a believer. I know right now some of you are like, Pastor, I don't like that. It offends me. That bothers me. What does verse 2 say? Check this out in verse 2. It says this, they act so pious. If we're not careful, one of the things I've learned about fasting is fasting brings me to a position of humility, a position, a position of laying my life down, a position where I am weakened and in need of God. And here's what I think the church needs more than anybody. Don't be offended. Don't get mad. Don't write me hate mail, please. But hear me for a moment. If we're 
we're not careful. We have a church that has all the knowledge. We have all the understanding. You can go find preachers so much better than you're ever going to get on this pulpit or platform. But here's what we lack. We lack the posture of just saying, God, speak to me, align my life, change my thoughts so I can obey you and take action to what you call me to. Fasting is less about what I know and more about who I'm in, whom I'm in relationship with. And it calls me to surrender, sanctify, consecrate, all these big words we use in church that simply say this, I'm going to strip away all the commonness that most of the culture has, and I'm going to be an uncommon person in a people of God in a church and say, God, I'm uncommon, but I'm matching my life with an uncommon God and a holy God. Do what you want to do in me and act upon what he says instead of just acting like a Christian. In other words, Timothy says this, there is a day coming in the church where we got a lot of people with a form of godliness, no power. We look the part, we raise our hands, we clap, we sing, we even have our Bible, we know our scripture, you can outquote me the scripture, that's all good things, but do we have power? Are we aligning ourselves with God? What does fasting do? It positions me in a place of humility and says, God, I'm not a wanting to act like a Christian, I want to behave like a Christian. There are people that do not know Jesus that act more Christ-like than we do. There are certain religions that are more Christ-like than the church. And I think fasting is one of those principles that separates me acting and taking action. And it's not done publicly, it's done privately. To many of us, I think if we're not careful, we become ill-informed regarding fasting and we view it as something to get God's attention to meet what I need when really it's the opposite of getting my attention to fall in line with what God needs from me. Hello? See, we live in a culture that's all about me. There were songs written about us. Me, 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 me. <laughs> There are slogans about it, iPhone, iPad, iPods. Some of you know this. You were raised in the era of MySpace. Some of you were raised, hey, if it feels good, do it. We're getting each generation, right? But that is a lie from the pit of hell that's all about me. And what fasting does is it takes me from being a me-centered Christ follower to an actually service-driven, serving him-driven Christ follower. And I think that's why many Christians suffer and struggle with fasting. And that's why if you're like me, I complain about it and I let the whole staff know I'm dying after 24 hours. <laughs> and yet God wants to shift in the the building of a spiritual house. You can see there is a correlation when churches in different areas and regions, I've studied a little bit recently about the church in China in the 40s and 50s, and uh, the, the largest Assembly of God church in the world used to be in China and in Hong Kong, two different churches, uh, Watchman Nee and Yangi Cho, these two pastors. You know what their church did almost without, uh, without hesitation? Prayer and fasting. And thousands upon thousands came to Jesus in a socialist country, a communist country, because they weren't concerned about them. Many of them gave their life for the gospel of Jesus, but they were concerned about him. What if the church could say, you know what? I'm just going to fast one day. I'm going to fast three days. I'm, gonna I'm not going to tell you how many days to fast. I'm just telling you, what if you bring it back into your spiritual discipline and give God some time every month, give God some time a couple times throughout a year and begin to fast again and lay down your pride and lay down yourself and hear from God again. What could happen in our lives and in the church and the culture around us? My fasting, yes, it gets God's attention, but that's not the sole reason I do it. I do it so God can get my attention. Fasting aligns my heart and my will to be more in tune with God's will. Okay, that's what I'm called to do in this. First six verses are, are clearly an attitude of fasting that we are not to have, a people of piety, a people that do things for the look, a people that are trying to get the pleasure of God. That's not what we're trying to do. We do it just because it's the right thing. Can I say this in a heart of love? Please don't be offended, but I think sometimes we always attach a motive and an expectation to what to do. What if we just start doing things because God said so and it's right? 
What if I fast just because God tells me it's important? What if I fast because Jesus modeled it and I should do what Jesus did because I'm called to follow Christ? What if I do it because the early church walked in it? What if I just do it because it's right and whether I get the results I hope to get or not, I just do it because it's the right thing? I think God is calling the church to start doing the right thing again instead of just doing things with an ulterior motive attached to it. So I'm called to fast. I'm called to be a person that comes together in the fasting, and I'm doing it for the reason to behave like a believer, not just act like a Christian. Secondly, in fasting, we learn from this passage. I'm going quickly, but the second thing we do is this. Fasting will call us to action. Say, I'm called to action. All right, I love this about fasting, but I've also learned why it's difficult in the church. Sometimes we don't like to be called to action. We just like to be called to be common. I read this the other day, and I cannot get it out of my spirit, and it so spoke to me in some areas. The opposite of holiness is not sin. The opposite of holiness is commonness. And see, what I think has happened in the church is we say, well, I'm not going to sin, but are there things that are common and just accepted and everyone else can do that are diluting my hunger for God or diluting my passion for God or it's causing me to not walk holy? Pastor, are you calling me to live? You want a bunch of rules? No, we just read about this. There was a group of people that were doing things to get a certain response and they were working really hard on themselves so God would notice. I'm not telling you to work hard. I'm not telling you to be holy by a list of actions, but what if God said, said, you know what? That may be common for everyone else, but I want you to be uncommon. Everyone else likes to eat three full meals a day. I want you to fast one, one day a week. Just be uncommon. Everyone else allows this in their life. What if you just step out of that and become uncommon? I remember growing up, by the way, it has nothing to do with fasting, but it has to do with this commonness thought. Uh, growing up and working for my dad for a few years as a youth pastor, I remember um, that my dad never let us, uh, I, for seven years working with my dad, I never went to a movie theater. It was one of the things my dad asked of us as a staff. And I look back and I'm like, that's kind of crazy. First movie I went to was, uh, by the way, if you're going to be abstinent for seven years from Hollywood, don't watch Tom Hanks, um, uh, The Castaway. There's like nothing said in that movie. That is the movie, like three hours long, and I got Tom Hanks talking to a volleyball. Wilson! I'm like, this is bad. Like, if this is what Hollywood is, I don't want it. You know what I'm saying? It was brutal. But my dad had these expectations, and it wasn't my dad. It was the pastor, and I understood authority. I'm serving with him. And and if I couldn't align with what he was asking of me as an associate, I need to get out. And, and, I, and I'll be really honest, that's a problem in the church today where many of us think, well, I am the, you're not the authority, God's the authority, and he places authority in certain line. That's not the message today, but here's the reality of it. I, I learned from my, my pastor who happened to be my father at that time, there were certain expectations he had of us as a staff, not because he wanted us to work out our salvation. He just felt like, hey, these are some uncommon ways I want you to rise up. We didn't drink, uncommon. Didn't go to Hollywood, uncommon. Didn't play cards. Dear God, uncommon. I look back, some of them crazy, some of them meaningful, some of them I do today. Here's the, uh, I still do that today. Here's the point. What is God calling you in a church service? Very little conviction gets traction. But when I get alone with God and I'm fasting and I'm open and he's got my attention, it's crazy. It's in those moments of fasting. God says, you know what? This is a little bit of common action. I want to change that in you. And I don't get up and say, hey, I'm this and I do this and I lay something out at the church to live different. I just start walking uncommon. Action. And the church in Isaiah chapter 58, verses two through five, that nation was very common. Look at us. Look what we did. I sang great. I was in church. I gave in the plate. I fasted. It was all about what they were seen and visible to those around them. And conviction and holiness gains traction when I fast and I pray and I get in the presence of God and I start to sacrifice some wants to get who he is and he's who I want. Hello? 
So fasting changes me to be more like him. And what would happen if a church could actually look different from a world because we get alone with God? By the way, please don't walk out of here and feel some guilt. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I've learned is I've sat where you are. I've been in services. I listen to podcasts and it doesn't always move me. I get convicted and I walk out and I go and I forget what I was convicted about. But when I get alone with God and I consecrate my heart and I fast and I sacrifice something that is a pleasure like food, I become begin to hear God and traction has to follow. Fasting calls us to action and it will often call us to action toward others. Let's look at a couple factors of, of, of fasting that we see in Isaiah chapter 58. Beginning in verse 6, the Bible says this, no, that's not the kind of fast that I want. This is the kind of fast I want. Isn't it interesting? It immediately goes into a fast dealing with how we treat others. Free those who are wrongly in prison and lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. You know what I've learned in my life? That when I'm so enamored with self, I don't even see the brokenness and the imprisonment of others. And you know what this world needs more than another big church and another big sermon and another great worship set? It needs a people of God that has a vision for the broken and the imprisoned and the bondage around us. And that is only moved, not with another sermon, but it's moved in the presence of God when I fast. Here's what happens. The first promise of a godly fast from Isaiah is this. Fasting will call you to freedom and it will demand a pivotal calling to seeing others led to freedom. Look at it, it says it, verse six. I want this kind of fast, the Lord says. It's one that calls you to the imprisoned. It's one that calls you to lighten those that are burdened. It's one that calls you to let the oppressed go free. Can I say this to you? First of all, in a fast, let God set you free. Let God bring your prison chains open and let God bring deliverance to your soul. And then we are called to be that in a world. Here's what'll change Journey Church is not about how good we are in here, but about how close we get to God and how sacrificial we are with our life. We will change the world around us and they may never come to this service for months, but they will come to the kingdom of God because you see the imprisonment and the oppressed and you go after it. Fasting gets your eyes off of you and gets them on what God's purpose is. What did Jesus come to do? Seek and save those who were lost. And you know what's careful in the church today? Sometimes it becomes all about us. Fasting takes my eyes off of me when I do it biblically and it puts it on God. That's why many of us, i.e. me, struggle fasting. Because I like me. Kirk Franklin wrote a song. I just thought of it. Anybody ever remember his song? I like me. Oh, you like me? Yeah, you like me because he likes me. It's the dumbest song. Go look it up. It's kind of crazy. It's all about that. Anybody remember that song? I don't know why that just popped in my head. But that's the church culture. Do you like me? Yeah, you like me. I like me. But what about them? I'm not saying us versus them. I'm just saying, what about the broken? What about the colleague that is bound by addiction and they come to work high every week and you do nothing about it because you don't have a vision for them because you haven't gotten a vision of God? What about the students that you walk with or the people that you teach or the people that you manage? Do you manage as an employer from a place of oppression or do you manage from a place of liberty? See their heart. As a church, I'm not going to get up here and put you in bondage. I'm just telling you, he who sets you free is free indeed. He who the sun sets free. Walk in freedom and see the oppressed go free. And it happens through a lifestyle of fasting. It's a promise of fasting. Jesus taught us to be a people that leads others in fasting. Why did he say there are only some demons come out with fasting and prayer? He was simply saying there are people that are so bound up by the oppressed world that you want to bring freedom. Do it by starting in fasting and do it by starting in prayer. Because here's what a lot of people do. There were people in this day that would pray in the name of Jesus. Nothing happened because some are actually brought free by fasting. Some of your victories are brought free by fasting. Others people freedom are brought free by your fasting. Fasting produces a closeness with God that produces an authority under God to believe for the impossible. When fasting lacks action, it's simply spiritual dieting. I have been so guilty in years past of calling fast and doing fast and I don't do anything to accompany the actual biblical principle of fasting. I just starve myself. 
Fasting calls me to a closer walk, to a prayer life, to an intercession, to a devotion, to a submission, to a humility. To just starve yourself a few meals, that's some kind of weird dieting program. But to go in that place of sacrificing my wants to get with what he wants, that's when I see things happen. I want to encourage you this week. Some of you are like, Pastor, why are we talking about this? Well, we kind of had it planned, and it's a surprise, and it's got you, whatever you want to be. But Wednesday night, we have an incredible night planned with our worship service that we're doing, and just a, just a worship night. Um, not going to get into the details, but we, we feel like God's speaking to us to do a, like a, a, a unique anointing type service in that setting. But, but I, I want to encourage you, what if you fasted the next couple days and just said, God, what do you want to do in me, and what do you want to do through me? I'm challenging Journey Church to say, God, I want to change our culture. I want to see the Verde Valley reach for the gospel. I want to see people set free. What if you took a couple days this week and and maybe you joined our staff who's going to just fast three days? I know Pastor Jerry, Pastor Tell hate that because they can't go get food with me. But but we're going to fast and we're going to pray and we're going to see God because we need God to move in our community. Need God to move in our lives. I encourage you to take a couple days. Maybe you take the three days and, and say, God, I'm just going to consecrate my life. By the way, I would never say this, and I feel like this needs to be said. If there are health issues or health conditions uh, that don't warrant you the ability to fast, I would never stand up here and say, if you are diabetic, fast three days. That's foolishness. I would never do that to you. Use wisdom. Seek the heart of God. But maybe there are some things food-wise you can say, I'm not going to give. I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to partake of. That would cause you to stretch. Don't do something unhealthy. Don't do something that would cause physical damage, but could it bring something to bring alignment to your life? He who the sun sets free is free indeed. Look at somebody and say, there's freedom in Christ. Come on, just tell them. There's freedom in Christ. It's interesting to me to note in the book of Isaiah 58 that we see freedom directly correlative to fasting. We see it not only there, we see it later on in the chapter, which I don't have time to get into, but we see this idea and this, this thing. Look what it says in verse 9. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Notice what happens when we come to God in a holy fast. He removes the yoke. You don't have to have some counselor do it. He does it. He sets you free. Fasting calls us to freedom and demands us to action and letting others go free. Second promise and principle to fasting I think is important in Isaiah 58 is found in verse 7. Share your food with others who are hungry. Give shelter to those that are homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then verse 10 says this. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine from the darkness. And the darkness around you will be bright as noonday. Isn't it amazing that the light that comes out of a Christ follower's life has nothing to do with the sermon you preach. Sometimes it's just the action you live. I'm not saying you don't preach. I'm not saying you don't share your story. I'm not saying any of it. But I'm telling you, there is a second factor of fasting that I think God is calling us to. It's not just walking in freedom and leading others into freedom, but I think it's also causing me to recognize others and their need. Isn't it interesting? Verse 7 is the very thing Jesus preached in the book of Matthew when he had all these people. And he said, I'm going to talk to you about the sheep and the goats. There were those who did these things in my name. They clothed the the, the naked in my name. They they visited me in prison and they they fed those that were hungry and they uh, they gave to those who were in need and they did all these things. And and the sheep look at Jesus and they're like, well, when did we see you? And here's, here's what's gonna happen at judgment day. The sheep would look at Jesus like, when did we see you do this? I think there is a desire of heaven that it becomes second nature that we just minister to the broken, that we love those that are wounded, that we feed those that are hungry. And here's what fasting does. It puts me in a place of realizing my need. And yes, I'm hungry and I'm suffering from that, or I'm putting myself in a position where I don't have pleasures. But more than that, it causes me to relate to others in their need. And Jesus looks at the sheep and he says, you did all these things. And they're like, when did we do it? Well, you did it to the least of these. You did it unto me. They were second nature believers that just did it because I believe they had a lifestyle that was so close to God. They didn't have to be coerced to act and behave on behalf of Jesus. But I find myself relating a lot of times, forgive me, to, to, to the goats that, that I have to be coerced or I have to work hard or I have to think through it. Or, but what could happen if the church could just posture ourselves like Isaiah 58? I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to feed the hungry. I'm going to give shelter to the homeless. By the way, this isn't the church's responsibility. It's the church's responsibility. 
See, we have gotten so far in our culture where the government has taken place of what the church should be doing, and the church has put it off on the global or corporate church when we're called to feed the hungry. I'm called to clothe those in need. It's not, hey, pastor, this guy. No, you go do it, and I'll do it. Hello? What could happen if in a daily encounter across this valley, someone came in contact with Jesus through Journey Church? Not Sunday where I drag them here and they have a need. You've, what are you doing for benevolence? That's the problem. Benevolence was not what God intended. It said they have everything together and they gave to those in need. It was an action of the church. Why do we do Project Rising Hope? Because we're trying to be Jesus with skin on. We're trying to be action to the community around us. But, but what could happen if I literally start having a secondhand nature like Jesus said in Matthew? You just did it to the least of these. Sometimes when I position myself fasting in a biblical manner, I realize how frail I am. Anytime you don't put fuel in, you, you lack nourishment and you get weakened. But you know what I love about fasting when I actually do it biblically? It causes me to see weak around me instead of just self. Instead of just driving by the dozens of people who are broken and homeless and pushing a cart, I actually notice them. And if I'm not careful, I might actually get out of my car and do something. Hello? I'm not trying to bring guilt. I'm just telling you, this is what fasting does. And what could God do through a church if we started fasting? What could God do through us if we started fasting? It causes me to see and recognize others in need. I'm not just talking about the physical, the hungry, the naked, or the homeless, but do we recognize those in need around us? Fasting aligns my life to Christ, to where I act out what Christ wants me to, and I obey him. Third characteristic of fasting that happens is in verse 8. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will heal quickly, and your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you will call on the Lord. He will answer, yes, I'm here. He will quickly reply, remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger at others with vicious rumors. Feed the hungry, help those in trouble, and your light will shine in the darkness. I think a third characteristic that happens when I biblically fast is this. It positions me to have a consecrated heart that draws the attention in the presence of a holy God. Notice what happens here, verse 8 through 10. His salvation comes like the dawn. He heals the wounds of my heart. The godliness that I begin to walk out will lead me forward. The glory of the Lord protects me from me. Notice what happens in the next few verses. And, and it's interesting how there are actions where to walk out. But then God gives attention to you. When you fast, God does bring attention to you. In your consecrated position, he begins to minister with salvation, with healing, with all of these things we see afforded to us. He begins to remove our oppression. He begins to take us from a people who point the finger to where we hold out our hands in love. Consecrated hearts will always draw the presence and the answer of a holy God. Test a minute. I dare you, test a minute. You need some answers, consecrate your heart and don't tell the world what your answers are that you need. Let him speak to you. Let him talk to you. Salvation, I love what it says. It says salvation will come like the dawn. What is it speaking of? When we fast, when we consecrate ourselves, when we put our hearts before God, it's literally like this common. You are afforded a new dawn every day. That sun's gonna rise. You may not rise because we don't know how many breaths we have, but we know the way God has ordained it. There is a new dawn that is coming. I'm here to tell you, when you find yourself in a position of fasting before God, you can count on his salvation coming regularly to you. His word coming to minister to you. It's not a one and done thing. It is a consistent practice of the presence of God when you fast. He's your protector. He's your introspection. You no longer point the finger. You let him point the finger. Fasting causes me to look at the reflection of my humanness and calls me to holiness. I said this a minute ago, but the opposite of holiness is not sinfulness. It's commonness. You know what I think the church needs today is not more sinlessness. It, we need less commonness. Romans 12, come out from among the world and be different. Excuse me, Romans 12 says this, don't conform to the way. We have a church culture, if we're not careful, we look like the world, we think like the world, we behave like the world. God's called us to be different, and I believe God calls us to a place where we're not common, and it happens in fasting. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor loves you. Come on, just say it, because some of you are staring at me like I don't. <laughs> 
I told somebody before service too, I'm like, this is the most unpopular and, and, and this message is not one that, that, that I think people just love, but I think it changes hearts. And then I love verse 12. Not only does fasting bring me to a place of, of holy living, which by the way, can I say this? Again, when we talk about holiness, we're not talking about a list of rules, but it's this producing of wholeness in one's life. What are the things that are common that people do that fracture you? That fracture your wholeness. That's a whole nother sermon. Number four, in terms of this idea of fasting and what it brought, brings me to is in verse 12. Some of you will begin to rebuild deserted ruins in your cities. Or in other words, you will begin to minister where there's been a laid waste in your city. Then you will be known as the rebuilder of walls and the restorer of homes. Fasting, I believe, from the book of Isaiah, not only brings holiness, it not only brings a call to action, it not only brings us to bring others to freedom, but I think fasting is what moves, let me say this. I'm trying to be very careful how I say this. I'll just say, I think fasting is calling many of us to start rebuilding some things that have been broken down by the enemy. And, and, and let me say this, please. Here, here's the thing. I, I think for too many of us, we have left the rebuilding to leadership or to pastors. And God's called all of us to be a part of rebuilding. There's some deserted ruins God's called you to and has called your family. There's some deserted ruins that God's called you to that have been laid waste. It's called a marriage that isn't going well, that you need to humble yourself fast and get the answer of God for your life and change it. There's some deserted ruins called generations that God's saying, I don't want it to be like it was. There's a new family tree I'm planting. Do it. There's some deserted ruins called your workplace or your job that he's called you to rebuild the walls rebuild the city. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins. I felt like the Lord spoke this to me in preparation. I think there's some of you, God wants to bring forth ministry in your life again, where you've let it go desolate. God wants to call out some ministry in you to begin to rebuild some things. It happens from God rebuilding you in a position and posture of fasting, but then it happens to those around you where you begin to see the greatness of God around you. Worship team, would you come as we're going to close? God is calling you to rebuild the ruins, desolate places in the Verde Valley, create his redemptive pla plan for others and toward others. What in your life needs rebuilt right now? What in your life needs reestablished, restored, reconciled? What in your life this week, would you da dare to take a couple days and fast and begin to say, God, what are you calling me to rebuild? What, what are you calling me to establish again? What are you calling me to grow again? Is it your finances, your spiritual walk? Maybe you're here right now and you realize, man, I, I'm not walking where I should be. There's no guilt in your life. There's no guilt put on you. But I'm telling you, what if you just fast and say, God, what do you want to do? And let him stir a new relationship and rebuild your walk with him this week. Some of you will rebuild the deserted cities and you will be known as a rebuilder of walls. You know what I'd love to happen? I would love if people saw us as Journey Church as just a rebuilder of walls. A rebuilder of protection, a rebuilder of righteousness, a rebuilder of hope, a rebuilder of purpose, a rebuilder of restoration. You know, what if people came to you and then maybe came to church, but they came to you because their marriage needs rebuilt and they didn't know where to go, they ran to you. And you could minister because you were fasting and praying and authority was in that position. God's called us to rebuild some things. So here's what I want to ask of you today. If you're here, and I'm going to ask really boldly this question, and you would just say, Pastor, I, I, I want to live holy, and there's some things common that I, I feel like God's speaking to me. It's not conviction that I'm trying to put guilt on you. It's just saying a response to say, God, I want to deal with that. I could go through about four or five things in the last three weeks that God has been hammering me on. One of them happens to be this thing I use to preach every week. When your daughter looks at you and says, Dad, we probably shouldn't say that word. How many of you know you probably shouldn't say that word? And it's common. It's not even cursing. It's just probably not edifying. God's been convicting me of some things here. But you would say this morning, Pastor, I, I, I feel like that's for me, but more importantly to God, I, I want to position my heart before God today in a manner of saying, I don't want to just do what's common. I'm willing to do the uncommon thing. 
I'm not even talking fasting, but that's something I think will come. Or maybe you're saying this one, I, I'm gonna commit to doing some fasting in my life and I'm gonna commit to this principle again. But the most important thing I felt today is if you wanna be uncommon, I want you without hesitation right now just to stand to your feet where you are and say, I, I want God to deal with that uncommon thing in me. Come on, maybe two of you, 20 of you, whatever. At home, would you join us as well? Father, we posture our heart before you. We position our heart before you. You know what it is. Would you just say, God, I give you that thing I've been doing, that, that action. It's not guilt, it's conviction. And I believe as you fast and you really get to... He's going to begin to bring a, a freedom from that thing in your life, that, that vice, that habit, that bondage. God, I pray for freedom right now in our lives. Lord, would you bring a freedom in our lives at Journey? Would you bring a freedom in this house like we've never known, experienced, or seen? God, would you set us free so we can be the conduits of freedom to those around us? Lord, as we choose to fast, and I believe many of us even this week will say, I didn't know, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to fast and make it happen in my schedule. Lord, as we choose to fast in, in, our, in our deficiency, in our withholding of a pleasure, would you give us a vision for others that are hurting and broken and wounded? God, call us to feed the, the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those imprisoned, love the unlovely. God, would you call us to that right now? And God, would you put our faith in action? Lord, forgive us where we've acted like Christians, but we've not behaved like Christ. We don't want to just act. We want to behave like you call us to. Would you just say this with me all across this room? Say, Jesus, I thank you that you're gentle and you're not judgmental, but I bring you my heart. I bring you my mind and I ask you to begin to align my life to be more like you, Jesus. Help me to be uncommon in my worship, in my service, in my faithfulness, and in my response to others. Forgive me where I've allowed commonness to steer my conscience. I just want to be more like you, Jesus. Now, here's a big one I want you to pray. Help me, Lord, to fast biblically so I can move in action for those around me. I choose to build my house and this church's house on the principle of fasting, but I need your help in Jesus' name. Father, as we leave this place in just a moment, we pray for your moving and your power and your presence to be with us. God, I pray for healing to move in this room as well, that you would just do a work in us. And as we fast these next few days, God, we're just anticipating you moving us forward. And I anticipate, God, that you're gonna do great things Wednesday night in our worship service as well. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor in Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, I wanna do something. I felt this as I was praying. If you need prayer, the Bible says to lay hands on those that are sick, lay hands on those in need. If you need prayer and you'd like prayer, we're done here, but we'd love to pray with you. If you're here and you want prayer today, would you just come to the front as the worship team just plays and uh, love to pray with you. Otherwise, God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord. We'll see you Wednesday night and I encourage you to fast something. God bless you. If you want prayer, come on forward. We'd love to pray with you.